Hey everyone, in this video I will be beginning my coverage of Grant Morrison's Animal Man. I will be specifically be breaking down volume 1 in this video, which covers issues 1 through 9. Now, I've always heard of Grant Morrison's Animal Man run as being something that you must read, and it's so influential and groundbreaking, and I've never read it before making this video, so I thought it would be really fun to dive into it and break it down for you all, and we can see together if this run really holds up and deserves all the praise that it gets. Now, I'm a big fan of Animal Man. I think he's really fun. I read Jeff Lemire's Animal Man run, and I thought the character is really amusing. He's kind of this loser, D-list character. Not very popular. He's a family man. He's an everyman. He's just trying to make his way in the world. He's very relatable, and I think there's a lot of fun to be had following his journey. And also, his powers are kind of amusing as well. Now, Grant Morrison is a writer that sometimes can be amazing, and sometimes his books can just be really trippy and weird and psychedelic, and may not be everyone's cup of tea. Now, this Animal Man run is, in many ways, very trippy and weird and psychedelic sometimes. So, uh, you may not love it all, but either way, it is very interesting. Another thing Morrison loves to do is pluck out these obscure characters from DC's history that maybe appeared in the 60s in like one or two issues, and bring those characters into his stories. And you're going to have some of that in Animal Man here as well. So yeah, let's dive into it now. Let's dive into Grant Morrison's Animal Man and see if it really holds up its place in DC Comics history. Animal Man Volume 1, written by Grant Morrison, art by Chaz Truog, Tom Grummet, and Doug Hazelwood. Before we dive into the story, let's go through some Animal Man background information. Animal Man made his first appearance in the Silver Age of Comics in 1965, in an issue of Strange Adventures 180. For the next 20 years, he sporadically popped up in a few comics, but was basically a very minor and obscure character. In 1985, DC published their huge crossover event comic called Crisis on Infinite Earths. That storyline would clean up DC's convoluted continuity and simplify it. The original Animal Man from the 60s appeared in that storyline as part of a superhero team called the Forgotten Heroes. So clearly he wasn't that popular or he was part of the Forgotten Heroes. In the aftermath of Crisis on Infinite Earths, many older obscure characters would be wiped out of continuity or changed or altered in the process. In 1988, Grant Morrison would begin his run on Animal Man, taking this obscure D-list character, Animal Man that was never popular, and really doing something innovative with him. Grant Morrison's version of Animal Man was slightly different than the Silver Age pre-Crisis on Infinite Earths version. Grant Morrison throughout his run would actually reference this pre-crisis version of Animal Man in a very meta way, and make it part of the story. So that is the publishing history of the character up to when Grant Morrison would begin his run. But now, who actually is Animal Man? Animal Man is about a man named Buddy Baker, who is both a family man and a superhero known as Animal Man. Animal Man often struggles to keep balance between these two sides of his life. Buddy got his powers while, as a teenager, he encountered a crashed spaceship that apparently endowed him with his Animal Man abilities. Buddy, with his powers, can mimic the abilities of any animal he is near by focusing on that animal. He cannot talk to animals like Aquaman talks to fish, nor does he transform into that animal. He can just mimic their abilities. When Morrison's run picks up, Buddy is in his late 20s, and he has had his powers for nearly 10 years or so. In those years, he had an unsuccessful stint as a superhero, followed by a hiatus where he utilizes powers to work as a stuntman in the movies. Buddy will soon have to decide what to do next in his career. Buddy lives in a suburban area outside of San Diego. He is married with two kids. His wife is Ellen Baker. She is his high school sweetheart. Ellen is a storyboard artist, and she is also working on a children's book which she hopes to eventually get published. 
Their children are Cliff Baker, a preteen boy, and Maxine, who is a toddler. With that background information, now let's dive into issue one. Animal Man number one, The Human Zoo. In San Diego, we see Buddy Baker, Animal Man. He climbs a tree. Buddy is trying to save a cat that is stuck up there. When he grabs the cat, Buddy then falls, but he uses his Animal Man powers to absorb some of the agility abilities of the cat, and Buddy easily lands on his feet, like a cat would. Buddy then returns the cat to its owner. The owner of the cat is a woman named Violet Widemere. She is Buddy's next-door neighbor. She thanks him. She explains though her other cat, Sheba, is still missing. She's been missing for a week now. She's worried about that cat. Violet's husband, Morris Widemere, is there as well. He is sleeping in their yard on the lawn chair with a hat over his face to protect himself from the sun. Morris, he just wants some peace and quiet. Buddy, he then arrives at his home where his wife Ellen is making dinner. Buddy tells his wife that he's made an important decision. He wants to go full-time into the superhero business again. Ellen says she's heard this before from Buddy. Buddy says that he's serious about it this time. He's going to get his act together. Buddy shows his wife a Rolling Stone magazine cover with some superheroes on it. Buddy says he's going to revive his Animal Man identity and join the Justice League International. Ellen speaks some real talk to her husband saying, Buddy, there are hundreds of super people in the world. I don't think they let everybody into the JLI. Couldn't you work your way up through some of the other superhero groups? What's that one with the weird looking guy who was on David Letterman? Um, Element Man? Buddy replies, the Outsiders. Come on, Ellen, I'm not joining the Outsiders. They're almost as bad as the Forgotten Heroes. I'm trying to get away from that stuff. In the JLI, I could do magazine interviews, talk shows, personal appearances. You wouldn't have to rely on your job to pay the bills. Buddy looking in the magazine says, I mean, look at this guy, Blue Beetle. What can he even do? He was just lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time. That's all. I've been a superhero longer than this guy and I've got real powers. Ellen argues, Buddy, you paid $800 for those Animal Man costumes and they've only been out of the closet half a dozen times in eight years. You know I don't really want to spend my life doing storyboards, but if it wasn't for the money I bring in, then we'd be living on the street. I mean, what about your stunt work, huh? When was the last time you took an assignment? Dreams don't pay the rent, buddy. You can't go on drifting through life, waiting for something to happen. As Buddy and his wife argue about money and what Buddy should do for his career, their son Cliff returns from school, and the two stop arguing. Maxine is then called down to dinner to join the others, and they all sit around the table. Elsewhere, outside of San Diego, we see a mysterious man named Bawana Beast, a.k.a. Michael Payson Maxwell. Bawana Beast is another obscure character, initially from the 1960s that Grant Morrison plucked away from obscurity to insert into this story. Bawana Beast's origin is that, years ago, Michael Maxwell and his best friend Rupert Kenboya were in Africa, and their plane crashed into Mount Kilimanjaro, and the two took refuge in a cave where Michael drank some rainwater that had been filtered through the mountain's minerals. Soon, from that rainwater, Michael began to become stronger and more agile, and he used his strength to overcome a powerful gorilla named Juba, who lived in that cave. After their short fight, Juba acknowledged Michael's superior strength and led Michael to a room in the cave that contained a magical helmet that allowed Michael to telepathically control and communicate with animals, and also it allowed him to have this biofusion ability where he can merge various animals together to form a unique creature. For example, he could combine a rhino and a buffalo. Mike then fought evil in the wilds of Africa as the hero Bawana Beast. He has superhuman strength, speed, agility, and this weird animal biofusion ability. Mike and Juba became companions. Recently, though, Juba had been kidnapped, and Bawana Beast, 
tracked Juba here to San Diego, and Buana Beast is here to free her. So as Buana Beast is walking around, he seems to be in some kind of pain, and he is searching for the source of this sound, the sound of screaming monkeys that he hears in his head. He thinks his companion, Juba, may have been taken to the source of these sounds. Eventually, Buana Beast managed to journey into San Diego. He made it into the city. He is in an alleyway. He is still suffering from those headaches and the sound of screaming monkeys. He rips off his helmet, and he is trying to get some relief. In that alleyway, though, a mugger attacks him and demands some money. Buana Beast kills the mugger without hesitation, and then he continues on his search. Back over to Buddy and his wife, Ellen. They both apologize for their argument earlier. Ellen, she doesn't love her job, and Buddy is trying to restart his superhero career. Buddy tells his wife that, you know what? She ought to finish her children's book. Ellen wants to, but she worries that no one is interested, and it might not be good enough. Buddy tells his wife that he has faith in her, though. He also tells his wife that he wants to start training again with his animal man powers and see what he can do. We see some of Buddy's training over the next few days. Swimming like a fish underwater, Buddy holds his breath underwater for 35 minutes. Apparently, when Buddy absorbs an animal power, it can only last for about 30 minutes or so. Buddy, he then flies in the air like a bird. He then absorbs an ant's ability to run really fast. On his fourth day of training, Buddy is with his best friend, Roger Denning, and Buddy is practicing swinging from a tree like a monkey. Buddy tells Roger, To be honest, Roger, I really don't know what to do next about all of this Animal Man stuff. How do I get myself known? Do I go out and beat on some bad guys or what? Roger, listening to his friend, offers to be Buddy's manager. Roger tells Buddy that he has some contacts in the media. He could get Buddy a spot on TV on the Dick Griffith Show. It would give Buddy some publicity. Buddy, he's interested in this. Elsewhere, Buana Beast has finally found the source of the screaming monkeys. It has led him to a Star Labs building in the city. Buana Beast drinks an elixir, which makes him more powerful. And then he decides how to tackle this situation in Star Labs. The next day, Buddy is home with his family, and he is watching his appearance on the Dick Griffith show that he made the night before. The host, Dick, introduced Buddy as LA's newest hero, Animal Man. But then the host cracked a joke, saying, Down, boy, and stay away from the fire hydrants. So, uh, where'd you get those powers, Animal Man? Buddy tries to start explaining, but then Dick just cuts him off and jokes, Well, I guess there's not much room for secrets in an outfit like that. How about it, ladies, huh? Dick is making fun of Animal Man's skin-tight outfit. Dick, he then ends the segment saying, Let's hear it for Animal Man, folks! The guy they call the Human Zoo! Buddy, he's kind of upset with his appearance watching it back now on TV. He doesn't think it really went that well. He says they cut all of his interesting stuff. His wife Ellen is kind of upset how they referred to him as the Human Zoo. What's that all about? Despite the not great TV appearance, the next day Buddy does get a phone call from Star Labs. Someone there saw his segment on TV, and they want his superhero help with something. Buddy is excited to have a gig. Ellen asks Buddy, What's up with the jacket? Why is he wearing that? And Buddy explains that after Dick making jokes about his skin-tight outfit, he decided to uh, add a jacket to his uniform. Plus, it gives him somewhere to keep his money and stuff. Buddy then hugs his wife, and then absorbs the ability of flight from a nearby bird, and he flies off to Star Labs. As Buddy leaves, Ellen talks to their other next-door neighbor, Trisha Denning. Trisha is married to Roger Denning, Buddy's long-term friend and now manager. Ellen asks Trisha if her husband Roger is serious about all of this manager stuff. Trisha answers, Listen, I didn't want to bring Buddy down, but Roger's serious about everything for at least a minute and a half. He's always had delusions of grandeur. 
Roger thinks he's a real big gun, but he only shoots blanks. Elsewhere, we see some rambunctious, aggressive hunters, led by a man named Ray. Ray shoots a bird in the sky and kills it, just for fun. Ray he then comments to his friends, <laughs> I blew the butt out from under him. Ray then gets into a car and drinks with his pals. Ray and his hunter buddies are planning to have a good time hunting over the weekend. Ray is excited to get away from his wife and kids. Later on, Animal Man arrives at Star Labs, and there a man named Dr. Myers meets Animal Man. Dr. Myers thanks Animal Man for coming to help. The truth is, they wanted Superman's help, but Supes is pretty busy, so they called him. Dr. Myers explains one of his assistants saw Animal Man's appearance on TV. So they decided to give Animal Man a shot here. As they're walking and talking, Animal Man explains how his powers work. Animal Man asks what uh, Dr. Myers and his team does here. Dr. Myers says they are working on a cure for AIDS by studying monkeys. Dr. Myers then shows Buddy one of their animal test laboratory facilities. It suffered a break-in last night, and the facility has been ransacked. There are broken cages and emptied medical containers all over the floor. Dr. Myers then shows Animal Man the main problem, though. All of the test monkeys here have somehow been fused together into one gelatinous ball, yet they are all still alive somehow. Very mysterious. Animal Man number two, Life in the Concrete Jungle. In a nearby forest near the baker's home, we see Violet Widemir's missing cat Sheba that she mentioned earlier to Buddy. It is out chasing a mouse in that forest. At Star Labs, Animal Man is looking at this gelatinous ball of monkeys. He asks, what is this thing? Dr. Myers explains it's a monkey. More specifically, it's several of our lab monkeys, apparently fused together into one unworkable organism. Animal Man asks, does this have anything to do with the research going on here? Dr. Myers explains, no. As he mentioned earlier, they are just working on an AIDS vaccine. Nothing they do would do this to monkeys. Animal Man asks, hmm, there was a lot of damage in this lab, but... It doesn't look like the monkeys could have caused this. That is when Dr. Myers explains something odd. It was actually a giant cockroach, like eight feet tall. It scared one of his lab assistants greatly, and it ran through the building, injuring one of their security guards in its escape. It is this odd cockroach man that caused all of this damage. When Dr. Myers was called in, he found these fused monkeys. And then they decided to phone in Animal Man. Animal Man says, well, he probably can't tell them how the monkeys got like this, but he can try and track down that insect man creature. He will simply find a dog and absorb some of the superior smelling powers of the dog, and then go search for this big insect by tracking it. Elsewhere, Buddy's neighbor's cat, Sheba, has caught the mouse, and she is using it to feed some of her newborn kittens. However, at that same location, Ray and his unscrupulous hunter pals are killing for sport in that same forest. Animal Man, having found a dog and absorbing the smelling abilities of a dog, is now following the scent and where it leads him all over the city. He's trying to track this insect man creature down. Eventually, though, he loses the trail, so he decides to take a break on a nearby building rooftop. While he is there eating, Superman just so happens to fly down to talk to Animal Man. Superman says, Hello there, we've met, haven't we? Your, um, um, buddy chimes in, Animal Man? Superman responds, Animal Man, of course! I like the costume, the big A. Animal Man asks Superman, what's he doing out here? Superman responds, well, I have an appointment in Pakistan in 20 minutes, so I've got some time to kill. I saw you with my telescopic vision and thought I'd say hello. Superman, with his super hearing, then hears an aircraft in trouble nearby. He says bye to Animal Man and then flies off to go deal with it. Animal Man wishes his interaction with Superman was a little bit more meaningful, but he's still excited to have met him. In an alleyway, Bawana Beast 
uses his biofusion powers to fuse a rat with a nearby homeless drunk. Buddy phones his wife from a payphone and tells her that he met Superman. Superman shook his hand. His hand still aching though from it. Ellen tells her husband she should have invited Superman to dinner. Buddy tells his wife, you can't just invite Superman to dinner. Before Buddy can continue on with the conversation, he gets attacked by the homeless drunk fused with the rat. The rat man hits Buddy and he gets flung back. While Buddy is fighting, Ellen, now off the phone with her husband, went with her daughter Maxine to go to the forest for a walk near their home. As they are walking in the forest, they come across the kittens that belonged to Sheba. Ray and those jerk hunters are there too, and they take a rather ominous gaze at Ellen, staring her down in a creepy way. Back to Buddy. He is continuing to fight this rat man. Their fight is going back and forth pretty equally. That is until Ratman grabs Buddy's arm and rips it off his body. Buddy falls to the ground and he's trying to stop the bleeding from his arm. Animal Man number three, the nature of the beast. Somewhere in San Diego, Bawana Beast senses the thoughts of an ape named Juba. Juba is Bawana Beast's companion and helped Buana Beast to get his powers. Juba has been kidnapped by the scientist at Star Labs, and he has been experimented on and been infected with a virus. Juba, while in a cage, watches a fellow ape die. Buana Beast vows to save his friend, Juba. Animal Man is dying in an alleyway after his arm was torn off by the Ratman hybrid. Animal Man uses his powers and senses an earthworm in the ground down below. He absorbs the earthworm's power and uses a worm's ability to regenerate its body. And by doing that, Animal Man is able to regrow his arm and heal himself. Animal Man now healed, eventually finds the Ratman hybrid, who has now been returned to human form. Animal Man calls Star Labs and tells them about his run-in with this rat man. Elsewhere, Ellen, Buddy's wife, is cornered in the forest by the aggressive hunters led by Ray. Ray grabs the cat, Sheba, and very meanly feeds it to his dogs that then feast on the cat. Ray then turns his attention to Ellen and makes some sexual advances on her. When she rejects him, Ray hits her with the butt of his gun. Ellen then notices her daughter Maxine is watching from the bushes. She screams for Maxine to run home and get help. Animal Man is waiting by this rat man's body, and eventually some Star Lab scientists show up in hazmat suits to check in on them. They tell Animal Man to get into their van as they deal with this scene as they need to quarantine this area. Meanwhile, Biwana Beast, still searching for Juba, remembers his time in Africa. He remembers his friend, Rupert Kenboya, that was murdered during a civil war there by a ruthless general. Buana Beast took his vengeance on that general and his men. Buana Beast rode down to the general on a lion merged with a bat or something, and he killed the general, and then with his helmet he controlled birds and other animals and made them attack the general's soldiers, and he killed them all. After Bewana Beasts successfully avenged his dead friend, Rupert Kenboya, Bewana Beasts returned to his companion, Juba, and he realized that Juba had been kidnapped. Bewana Beast then tracked Juba across the ocean, and that is how he wound up in San Diego at Star Labs. Bewana Beast has now returned to Star Labs again. His initial attempt to free Juba from Star Labs failed. He initially tried to take a hands-off approach and send in this cockroach man-type hybrid to try and get that creature to free Juba, but this time Buena Beast is going to try and free Juba himself. He fights through the security guards and scientists inside. He is sure that Juba is here, and he is not leaving without her. Elsewhere, Maxine Baker runs home 
she finds her neighbor, Morris Widemere, sleeping outside. She cries and tells him what is happening to her mom. Morris snaps awake and immediately jumps into action. The Star Labs van arrives back at Star Labs with Animal Man. They arrive just as Biwana Beast is done his rampaging and is escaping with his companion ape, Juba. Dr. Myers then runs outside and says, Get after him! We're dealing with a dangerous infection here! Animal Man wonders, what does Dr. Myers mean, dangerous infection? Animal Man demands to know the real story behind the animal testing going on here in Star Labs. Dr. Myers admits the truth. The tests they were doing were not meant to find an AIDS vaccine, but rather to create a germ as part of a biological weapon. They had kidnapped Juba in Africa because of her uniquely advanced primate physiology. She had a much bigger brain than normal apes. So they experimented on her, and they infected her with mutant anthrax, which is also lethal to humans. Dr. Meyer is worried, though, now that Juba has escaped, this anthrax contagion is loose in San Diego. Back to the forest near the baker's home. Ray and the hunters are still cornering Ellen. The dogs have ate and killed Sheba the cat. Ray starts unbuckling his belt as he prepares to have his way with Ellen. Even Ray's hunter buddies, though, are getting a little uneasy about how far Ray is going. They're telling him he's going too far. He's going to get them all in trouble. Ray doesn't care. He seems determined to continue. That is when Ellen's neighbor, Morris Widemere, arrives with Maxine. Morris has a revolver with him. He threatens to shoot Ray. Ray grabs his rifle, but before he can do anything with it, one of Ray's own hunting buddies shoots Ray in the head. The hunting buddy then says, too far, too far. Ellen grabs a branch and beats Ray with it. Morris grabs Ellen and comforts her and pulls her away from Ray. Ellen's daughter, Maxine, is there. She is holding some of Sheba's kittens that are now motherless. She asks, what about the kittens? At Star Labs, Animal Man is upset with the work that they are actually doing here in Star Labs. They get word that Buana Beast has been spotted in the zoo nearby. Animal Man goes to deal with it. He has to stop the spread of this anthrax contagion before it spreads throughout San Diego. At the zoo, Buana Beast attempts to comfort his companion, Juba. He is holding Juba in his arms, but there is nothing he can do for her. And Juba dies. And Buana Beast then screams in anger. Ah! Animal Man, Issue 4. When we all lived in the forest. Animal Man, before heading to the zoo, went to the library to research a little bit on Bawana Beast, who is a known superhero. So in a book called Who's Who in the Superhero Community, Animal Man read all about Bawana Beast and his powers, and he figured out that Bawana Beast came to Star Labs to free his companion, Juba, and he didn't want to come out of the shadows initially, so he created the Roach Monster to break into Star Labs and try and free Juba that way. The gelatinous mass of monkeys combined together in the lab was probably an unsuccessful attempt to fuse more than two animals together. And when none of his fusions could rescue the captured ape, Buana Beast was forced into the open to do it himself. Animal Man, he then hurries off to the zoo. And there, he finds the ape Juba, dead from the virus. Buana Beast is then standing there and confronts Animal Man. Animal Man tries to tell Buana Beast that he is on his side. He doesn't think they need to fight about this. But Buana Beast, with his superior strength, punches Animal Man, and Animal Man flies back into a nearby pond. While that fighting is going on, at the baker's home, Ellen is with Maxine as well as their next-door neighbor, Violet Widemere. They are all trying to nurse Sheba's kittens they found back to health in order to save them, but it seems like it is too late. All of the kittens have died. Back at the zoo, Animal Man is fighting through some various fused animal creations that Buana Beast has made. 
such as a gorilla tiger and an eagle ape, I think. Finally, Animal Man catches up with Boana Beast again. Animal Man harnesses the strength of an elephant and punches Boana Beast, and Boana Beast is thrown into a rock wall. Boana Beast then uses his animal mind control ability to control Animal Man's brain itself. He tries to shut down Animal Man's automatic nervous system. Animal Man uses some of his own powers, though, his powers that let him borrow an animal's abilities, and he uses it on Bawana Beast himself. And he absorbs Bawana Beast's own powers and turn them back onto him. So they are both using these kind of mind control powers, and they are both deadlocked in battle with one another. Their thoughts are wrestling in the air between them. Neither of them are dropping their defenses. Finally, though, Bawana Beast collapses as a result of having contracted that virus from Juba's body. Bawana Beast now believes he is dying. He is talking with Animal Man. He discusses the state of human civilization and how humans mistreat animals and nature. Animal Man removes Bawana Beast's helmet. Bawana Beast is sweating profusely. He is not going to survive much longer. But Animal Man realizes he still has Bawana Beast's fusing powers, including the power to fuse organisms into super hybrid forms. Animal Man decides to try and do this to Bawana Beast's own white blood cells within his body. So he manages to fuse Bawana Beast's white blood cells into super defenders. And in a few minutes, Bawana Beast's body manages to fight off the virus. He is going to live. Animal Man, in the aftermath of this, leans Bawana Beast up against the wall. He is not going to drag this man to jail, as Bawana Beast is a superhero and a good man, at least according to Animal Man's own ethics. As Animal Man is leaving the zoo, he unfuses some of the animals that Bawana Beast fused together, separating the tiger and gorilla once again, and then he heads off and returns to Star Labs and tells them the situation was handled. He also tells them he let Bawana Beast and Juba go. Dr. Myers is furious. Animal Man doesn't care. He expresses his shame at becoming involved in Dr. Myers' barbaric and immoral activities. Animal Man goes to leave, and Dr. Myers is cursing him out, saying, We need that ape! Our work here is nowhere near finished! Ah, I knew we made a mistake hiring you, you useless small-time superhero! Animal Man then punches Dr. Myers in the face and storms off. That night, when Buddy returns back home to his family, he tucks in his kids, and he checks in on his wife and the horrors of her day. In all of the heartache today, there was one happiness. One of Sheba's kittens is going to live. Ellen is holding it and nursing it back to health. Back at Star Labs that night, a recovered Buana Beast returns with Juba's corpse and tells Dr. Myers, Pick up the telephone, Dr. Myers. Tell your people you have the ape. Dr. Myers phones his colleagues and tells them the ape has returned. Buana Beast then, as vengeance, fuses Juba's dead body with that of the living Dr. Myers. Dr. Myers is now in Juba's body. Buana Beast leaves, and then Star Lab scientists come in the room, and they grab Dr. Myers, who they believe is Juba, and they take him in for testing for all of their weird experiments. Dr. Myers, as an ape, tries to scream, tries to communicate that he is actually Dr. Myers, but he fails. A tear rolls down his ape face as the scientists get to work on him. Animal Man Issue 5, The Coyote Gospel This issue was nominated for an Eisner Award for Best Single Issue Slash One-Shot. It is a really batshit insane issue <laughs> where we really see trippy psychedelic Grant Morrison. One year ago, while driving through the desert, a truck driver picks up a hitchhiker named Carrie, who is headed to Los Angeles to be a star. While driving, they are singing along on the radio and getting along quite well. Along the way, though, the truck driver accidentally runs over a coyote man that was in the middle of the road. 
and appeared to come out of nowhere. Both the truck driver and Carrie were horrified by what they saw. What was that thing? But they don't stop the truck and they keep on driving. Now that coyote man on the street that got run over miraculously heals from its wounds and comes back to life. We see this coyote man. His name is Crafty. Crafty, now alive again, continues running through the desert. We now jump ahead to the current day, which was one year since the coyote Crafty got run over and came back to life. At home, Buddy Baker is going through their fridge, and he is throwing out all of the meat in the refrigerator. Buddy, having become closer to animals, now feels it is wrong to eat meat, and he wants the family to be vegetarian. Buddy's son Cliff is not happy about this. What are they supposed to eat? Buddy suggests tofu. When Buddy's wife Ellen comes home, she also is not happy to see her husband has decided this for the whole family and is throwing out all of their food. This is something they should talk about together, she says. I mean, have you thought about what we're going to eat after you throw all the groceries in the garbage? Buddy argues, Ellen, these are dead animals. Have you any kind of idea of the terrible conditions these animals live in before they get dragged down to the slaughterhouse and get turned into somebody's groceries? After their argument, Buddy storms out. Now that same truck driver we saw at the beginning of this issue, he has returned to the desert, where he previously ran over that coyote man a year ago. The truck driver is hunting the coyote man now, having discovered that the coyote is still alive. The truck driver believes that the coyote must be the devil. In the time since their previous encounter, the truck driver has suffered numerous misfortunes, including the deaths of his loved one, Billy, his mother, and he lost his job. But what really set him off was when he saw in the newspaper that Carrie, the hitchhiker he picked up, she ended up a drug-addicted prostitute who died during a drug bust. It was too much misfortune in too short a time. He felt it had to be connected to that coyote. That coyote was Satan himself. It was then that he decided that the coyote man, the devil himself, must die. He is determined to save the world from him. The truck driver tracked down the coyote man and shoots him with his rifle. The coyote man, Crafty, takes a bullet through his collarbone and shoulder blade and gets thrown off of a cliff. Crafty seemed to pedal his feet in the empty air for a moment before he fell. When Crafty fell to the bottom of the canyon, he broke his spine, crushed his skull, his jaw was unhinged, both of his legs were snapped. The truck driver looked down the canyon at Crafty, but somehow Crafty was still alive and healed. The truck driver threw an oversized boulder down the canyon, and it crushed Crafty. The truck driver then goes around and travels down the canyon to make sure that this devil creature is in fact dead, but Crafty is somehow still alive. Animal Man just so happened at that time to be flying above in the air. The truck driver, he set up some bomb tripwire near Crafty. The truck driver warns Crafty not to move, there's a bomb here, but it is of no use. Crafty triggers the bomb, it blows up. Animal Man sees the blast from the sky, and he flies down to check it out. A dust cloud has formed in the air around Crafty. Crafty is still alive, his body reforming. The truck driver watches in horror. Animal Man, as he flies down, sees Crafty and tries to communicate with him. Crafty removes from his neck some sort of scroll, and he gives it to Animal Man. The scroll explains what Crafty is and how he came to be here. Have you guys figured out what Crafty is supposed to be? All right, time for the reveal. On the scroll, it explains that Crafty was exiled from another dimension, one similar in nature to Looney Tunes style cartoons. Crafty is essentially a parody of Wild E. Coyote, who often would fight with the Roadrunner and try to get him. In Crafty's world, him and many of his other fellow companion cartoon characters, 
often endured an eternity of suffering and violence, all for the amusement of their creator, their artist, who is seen as a cruel god figure in their world. Well, one day, Crafty had enough of the violence, so he went up to their version of heaven in his reality to challenge this god, aka this artist, and argue against the futile brutality of their existence. The god of their world, who is the artist, who draws these characters, who has a paintbrush by his side, is displeased by Crafty's presumption to challenge him. The god of that world told Crafty, You must be punished for this rebellion against my will. Nevertheless, I am a good god, and my judgment will be tempered with mercy. The artist exiled Crafty out of their Looney Tunes reality and into this reality, the reality of Animal Man in the DC Universe, where Crafty was given flesh and new blood. And then he was run over by that truck, but he recovered from that. Crafty was taught new pain and death and resurrection. It seemed there was nothing that could truly kill him. And while he lived in this world, he still held the hope that one day he might return to his other world and overthrow that tyrant god and build a better world. Animal Man, having read this scroll, has no idea what it says. He is unable to read it. He can't decipher the alien script it is written in. Animal Man, he's trying to determine what is happening here. But the truck driver, he loads a silver bullet into his rifle. And he shoots at Crafty once again. And the silver bullet goes right through Crafty's heart. And Crafty goes down. And it finally seems that Crafty has died. The truck driver now has tears in his eyes and he says to himself, I did it, Billy! I saved the world! Animal Man comforts the dying Crafty, the god of the Looney Tunes type world, the artist, with his paintbrush, then paints in the red of Crafty's blood as it pools on the ground around him. That is the end of this issue. Now, I just want to comment that this whole concept of the artist or writer or god of this world interacting with the story itself is a theme we will see reoccurring throughout this Animal Man run by Grant Morrison. Animal Man Issue 6, Birds of Prey There was a DC storyline going on at the time called Invasion that had to do with some alien races led by this race called the Dominators and another one called the Kuns that were coming to Earth to deal with the threat posed by Earth's metahumans. And they were going to go to war with the planet. Well, this issue of Animal Man was tying into that invasion storyline. Another alien group called the Thangarians, which is the race that the hero Hawkman is. They were under a dictatorship at the time and they were against Earth and they were part of this war as well, coming to do battle. Two Thangarian agents, Rokera So and Scala Cole, are journeying towards Earth on a spaceship. On that spaceship, Scala Cole tells Rokera So, I have spoken with the Kuns and the Dominators. Permission has been granted. Your performance may proceed. Rokera So is apparently an artist. He performs a weird Thangarian art form with tectonic planetary fractal geometry. Rokera Soul is going to Earth on a suicide mission. He ingests a fatal poison known as Hellshade. He explains what Hellshade does to his body as such. The Hellshade has set my soul on fire all at once. I see the endlessly complex fractal nature of forms points shuddering and strobing off to infinity. My blood becomes lava. I am the death bird, a thing of rock. My heartbeat measures a geological time. I feel invincible. I can do anything. And in the end, only one thing matters. The performance. Rokera So then walks by a whole bunch of other Thangarian soldiers standing on guard. Rokera dons something called a death mask. When he gets to Earth before he dies, he intends on detonating something called a life bomb. A life bomb is a weapon that contains the sum total 
of Rokera So's life experiences inside of it. Anyone caught within its blast radius will experience his entire history before dying. On Earth, Animal Man, aka Buddy Baker, is talking with his best friend and manager, Roger Denning. They are outside somewhere getting ice cream. Roger is worried that Buddy is becoming obsessed with this Animal Man stuff. He's vegetarian now? What's that all about? Roger, he only gets calls from animal rights groups who want Buddy to help them rescue lab rats. Buddy, he says, you know what? I'll do it. I'll save those rats. What makes humans more important than rats? Rats don't devastate rainforests or stockpile nuclear weapons. As they are talking, they hear a loud noise that rocks the area they are in. That Thangarian spaceship flies above them and lands nearby. Buddy, he decides to jump into action as Animal Man to check it out. Brokera So and Scala Cole are now on Earth. They have parked in a clearing somewhere. They also appeared to have killed some nearby cops that came to investigate them. Rokera So begins preparing the life bomb. He plants it in the ground. The life bomb looks kind of like a shiny gold sphere. Animal Man, he arrives and presents himself to the Thangarians. Animal Man asks, What the hell is going on here? Rokera tells Scala to kill this earth animal. Scala Cole flies into the air and swoops down on Animal Man and whacks him with a mace. Animal Man, he begins running, and he dives into a nearby lake. Within the lake, he absorbs some fish powers and it can breathe underwater. Scala Cole, with her wings, is flying over the water, trying to spot Animal Man. Animal Man, he pops out of the water and grabs Scala Cole and drags her into the lake. Animal Man, as he's wrestling with her under the water, tries to think to himself. If he remembers correctly, the way that Thangarians fly is that they wear a belt that provides them anti-gravity and it raises them off the ground and allows them to fly. And their wings are made of something called Anth Metal and are harnessed to their body to allow them to control their flight. So Animal Man in the water he manages to remove Scala Cole's Nth Metal Wings from her back, so Scala Cole can no longer control her flying. However, she is still wearing her anti-gravity belt. So all of a sudden, her anti-gravity belt causes her to fling high into the air and keep going higher and higher. Animal Man is a little surprised at how drastic Scala's anti-gravity belt has flung her into the sky. He figures, uh, surely she'll know what to do. Scala does not, though. She was flinging higher and higher into the air, not sure how to switch off her belt. And I am pretty sure she died. She either got flung into space or she finally turned off her belt, but she fell to the earth and would have died on an impact. While that was going on, Rokera has been programming the life bomb to detonate. Animal Man eventually flies over to him. Rokera grabs Animal Man and sticks him in a tree. Animal Man asks, who is he? Rokera then explains, I am an artist, possibly the finest of my generation. My recent work has been with planetary tectonics, and today's performance will be my grand finale, my martyr piece. Perhaps you are familiar with the concepts of fractal geometry? A fractal shape is one which reveals more detail, more information upon closer examination. It can be magnified indefinitely and still reveals new complexities. I made this life bomb. I've psi recorded my entire life experience onto the bomb, fully cross-referenced and infinitely detailed. The bomb will conduct a high-speed random search through my life fractal and when it encounters my most emotionally charged moment, it will detonate. A simultaneous telepathic transmission will bombard spectators with everything I've ever said or done or witnessed. My life will flash before your eyes, too. Rokera has also placed the bomb on one of Earth's fault lines, so it may destroy much of the Earth when it goes off as well. Anything left 
will be mopped up by the invasion force. Brokera now stops talking to Animal Man and he thinks about his life. He remembers his father showing him fractal images as a child. This is what inspired him to be an artist. When Rokera first saw them, he thought it was beautiful. His father told him, Watch the magnifications. The set is generated by a recursive computer loop and is designed to reveal new complexity at every level. You're looking at the face of infinity. No life is long enough to see it all. Rokera replied at the time, But that's not fair. I want to see it. I want to see it all. Rokera, in the current day, Remembering that moment, says to himself, Oh, Father, I understand now. I've seen enough. For Kara, he then passes out and dies. The bomb hasn't detonated yet, but the bomb begins the detonation process. An animal man starts seeing the entirety of this Rokera Sou's life flash before his eyes. He sees Rokera being born. His birth caused his mother's death. His father did not seem to want to hold his son with much love. When he was older, Rokera became an artist instead of a warrior like his father wanted. After seeing one of his art shows, Rokera's father declared that he had no son, and they never spoke again. Eventually, his father died. Rokera at the funeral watched his father's ascent, the anti-gravity launching his dad into the heavens. Rokera shed a tear. While all of this is going on, Animal Man is still trying to disarm this bomb, but he is struggling due to all the images of Rokera's life flashing in his brain before his eyes. Rokera all his life created art, dabbled with fractal infinities. He worked his whole life and eventually composed what he thought was his greatest art piece. He described his work as such. It is my father, it is me, it is the finest, most powerful work I will ever produce. I call it the bird of prey, the warrior soul. I stare at it for a whole day, weeping sometimes, and then I destroy it, and I am set free. Animal Man, he's still trying to disarm this life bomb, and he's freaking out. The images are hurting his brain, and this bomb is about to blow, and it will cause earthquakes and major destruction. But then, Hawkman, one of Earth's heroes, shows up. Hawkman merely presses a button on the life bomb, and the bomb shuts down and is inactive and it doesn't blow, and the images in Animal Man's head of Rokera's life stop. Hawkman tells Animal Man, all you had to do was switch it off. And with that simple solution, the Earth is anticlimactically saved from Rokera So's life bomb. Animal Man number 7, The Death of the Red Mask So, the events of that invasion book I mentioned last issue, well, they happened. The aliens came, there was some fighting, but sure enough, the world was saved by Earth's heroes. Animal Man chipped in as well, but I think it was mostly other big heroes that saved the day. So, this issue is taking place in the aftermath of that invasion. Animal Man did his part in the invasion and helped out where he could, and now he is flying on his way home. But on his way back home, he takes a pit stop in Miami. The city has suffered some damage in that alien invasion, but beyond that, it has another problem. For some reason, it is now overrun by these rampaging red robots. Fortunately, the robots are pretty terrible and ineffective. They simply explode and walk into things. Animal Man sees a cop and talks with him. The cop explains, Yep, said he took a couple of bad hits from a cunned fighter day before last. And as if that wasn't enough, all this started happening. Red robots out of nowhere. You ever seen anything so stupid looking? Animal Man asks, What are the robots doing? The cop answers, They're just stomping around, blowing themselves up, breaking things. They really don't seem to work too well. Watch this! The cop shoots one of the robots and it blows up. Animal Man, he decides to fly high in the air and see if he can discover the source of these ineffective red robots. 
As Animal Man is flying in the sky, he comes across a portly old supervillain in a costume on a rooftop. This villain is named the Red Mask. The Red Mask is preparing to jump off the roof of this building and commit suicide. Animal Man flies over to the man and tells him, Stop! Stop! Don't do it! Don't jump! The Red Mask, he stops and he asks Animal Man, That's kind of a funny thing to say. What makes you think I can't fly? <laughs> nah, you're right. I can't. I'm the Red Mask. Pleased to meet you. The two of them talk. Animal Man goes to shake the Red Mask's hand, but the Red Masker explains, actually, he has something called a death touch, so probably best they don't shake hands. Animal Man asks the Red Mask if he is responsible for all of these robots all over the city. The Red Mask replies, Sure I am. I'm a supervillain. How about those robots, huh? Damn things never worked back in the 40s and they're even more useless now. I won them off of Dr. Fang in a poker game. The Red Mask then decides to reveal his secret origins to Animal Man. The Red Mask explains that in 1945, he touched a meteor which fell to Earth, and it gave him the power of a death touch, killing everything he laid his hands on. His wife left him, not wanting to be with a man who couldn't touch her, so he became a supervillain. He teamed up with another villain named The Veil to commit some robberies. Unfortunately, the Veil eventually went insane as a result of his powers and was put in Arkham Asylum, bringing an end to both of their villain careers. Animal Man asks, why are you sharing this story with me? The Red Mask explains, well, he is dying, and he doesn't want to die in a hospital hooked up to tubes, so him releasing these robots is his attempt to go out in a blaze of glory. Animal Man tells the Red Mask that, you know, he doesn't seem like a bad guy. The Red Mask replies, I don't, huh? I got a death touch and an army of killer robots and I got a skull drawn on my chest. And I don't look like a bad guy to you? You might be in the wrong business, pal. All I ever wanted in life was to fly. That would have been enough. I could have joined the Justice Society and made something of my life. Animal Man really doesn't want to see this guy commit suicide, so he offers to use his connections to his friend Roger Denning and see if he can get the Red Mask some airtime on TV. The Red Mask could tell his story to the world the same way that he just told him now. It would be great. The Red Mask, he seems kind of interested in this. TV, hmm? Animal Man gets excited that he may have talked this guy out of ending his life. He tells him, yeah, just stay here. I won't be a minute. The Red Mask says, okay. As Animal Man, he leaves to go deal with the remaining robots in the city. The Red Mask, standing on that rooftop, grows impatient waiting for Animal Man to return. So, he decides to throw himself off the building anyway. See if he can fly. As he is falling for a moment, he experiences his dream of flying and he says, I can do it! I can fly! But then he splatters on the sidewalk below and dies. Animal Man deals with the remaining robots and then prepares to fly back to the Red Mask and then home. But of course, he would soon discover on his way home that the Red Mask didn't make it. As Animal Man is flying home, we see the page goes black and white and x-ray like. Initially, I didn't understand what the significance of this was, but apparently as part of that invasion storyline, the aliens detonated something called a gene bomb, and it would make a metahuman's powers go all wonky. And it just so happened to affect Animal Man now as he was flying home. We will see the repercussions of this gene bomb on Animal Man next issue. Animal Man Issue 8 Mirror Moves Following the events of that invasion, the aliens dropped something on the Earth called a gene bomb. Not the life bomb, a gene bomb. Apparently it's different. And because of this gene bomb, it made Animal Man's powers not work properly. Now, when Animal Man tries to absorb an animal's power, he sometimes gets a random animal's power nearby. Everything's just a little mixed up. He's also suffering from a fever. Animal Man, as he is lying in bed, is awoken by his wife, Ellen. 
Animal Man is pretty excited though, as recently he has been invited to join the Justice League Europe, and his membership card has arrived. He's thrilled about it. He's going to start earning a salary, and this card is going to get him into all sorts of embassies and stuff. By the way, in case you're wondering, even though he's working for the Justice League Europe, I guess they have some sort of teleporter that will, like, transport him to Europe, so he won't have to fly over there every single day from San Diego. Ellen, she warns her husband, though. Have you told them that your powers are all screwed up? Animal Man admits, well, no, not yet. Ellen says, you're going to have to tell them before the first meeting. I don't really think it's enough to just have a nice costume. Animal Man is not happy to hear this. He decides to ignore this for now and just start his day. Animal Man goes to the bathroom and begins to wash his face. As he is washing his face, someone is staring at him in the mirror. He sees himself in the Animal Man costume staring back at him. The Animal Man in the mirror starts mocking him. It then climbs right through the glass and attacks him. Animal Man goes flying under the bathroom and he falls down the stairs. This doppelganger that came through the mirror then reveals himself. This man is Evan McCulloch, aka the Mirror Master. Mirror Master has been hired to send Animal Man a warning. Mirror Master then attempts to shoot Animal Man with a ray gun of some sort. Animal Man avoids the blast. He runs upstairs to his bedroom and quickly puts on his uniform. Mirror Master then joins Animal Man in his bedroom and mocks him some more. Animal Man punches Mirror Master, and Mirror Master shatters into several pieces of glass. This was, of course, Mirror Master just messing with Animal Man with some of his various abilities. Mirror Master is fine. Animal Man asks him, Why are you doing this? He doesn't even know him. Mirror Master explains, Well, you've been a bit of a troublemaker, haven't you? Messing up a military research program? assisting subversive animal rights groups. The people I work for want to teach you a wee lesson. They want you to know they can get to you. Doesn't matter what you're doing or where you are. They can get to your family as well, and distance is no object. Mirror Master, he then disappears into a mirror. Animal Man yells for him to wait. Ellen, Animal Man's wife, returns from the grocery store. As she is walking to her home, an unidentified figure watches her from the shadows and it says her name, Ellen. Who is this mystery figure? That is something that will be explained much later in the series. Ellen enters her home and she's angry when she sees all the damage to the house. Animal Man warns her that a villain known as Mirror Master is here in the house and he's fighting him. Animal Man decides then to walk through a mirror and he enters the Mirror Dimension, and the Mirror Dimension is very disorienting to Animal Man, and he falls over and gets dizzy, and Mirror Master continues mocking Animal Man some more, and he also knocks him around a bit. The Mirror Dimension is very confusing, Animal Man at one point seems to be upside down on the ceiling. Mirror Master steps out of the Mirror Dimension and back into the Baker's home, where he is face to face with a very angry Ellen. Ellen is furious, she says. What makes you think you can just walk into people's homes and start smashing things up, huh? Are you prepared to pay for all this damage? If you want to fight, go fight someone else. She then kicks him in the nuts. <laughs> and this allows Animal Man to escape the Mirror Dimension and get back to the normal world. Mirror Master slaps Ellen in the face. So she kicks him and Mirror Master falls down the stairs. At the bottom of the stairs, Animal Man is there standing over Mirror Master, and he asks him, Did you just hit my wife? Animal Man then tosses Mirror Master outside the window of his house, into the front yard. Mirror Master angrily zaps Animal Man with a ray gun. Apparently, this ray gun turns Animal Man into a human looking glass. Mirror Master is preparing to leave. Before he goes, though, he tells Animal Man, Just you remember, this was only a warning. Next time it'll be for real. Mirror Master then disappears into a mirror he brought with him from inside the house. Animal Man, now a human looking glass, he starts assuming the shape of every person he comes into contact with. 
first he turns into Ellen. And then as Ellen, he runs into a man in the street and then transforms into that man. The spell is finally broken, though, when Ellen manages to break a small mirror. And this returns Animal Man back to normal. Ellen comments, though, Hmm? Broken mirror will cost us seven years bad luck? The same unidentified figure continues watching from the street. Epilogue 1. Mirror Master returns to the people who hired him, and he gets paid. Epilogue 2. A physicist named James Highwater has amnesia. He stands on a peak in the Arizona desert and asks some questions of himself. He does not recall how he got here or who he is. Epilogue 3. In the Baker home on Buddy's computer, an Albert Einstein quote reads, I cannot believe that God plays dice with the cosmos. Albert Einstein. Then, all of a sudden, someone unknown edits the computer and adds, He doesn't. I do. This is a tease of something that will be revealed much later. Animal Man Issue 9 Home Improvements Cliff Baker is walking home from school when a bully named Mike Buckley makes fun of him and calls him Animal Boy. After his run-in with the bullies, Cliff continues walking home. And as he's walking home, the same mysterious unidentified figure we saw watching Ellen last issue is also watching Cliff. And the unidentified figure says Cliff's name. At the Baker home, Buddy is playing with the family cat, TC, while Buddy's daughter Maxine is getting impatient as she wants to play with the cat. There is a knock at their door. They have a visitor. It is the hero Martian Manhunter. Martian Manhunter says he is here because he wants to welcome Buddy into the Justice League Europe. A perk of the gig is that their house will be repaired for free from any supervillain damage. So some repairmen come in with Martian Manhunter and they begin fixing the house after all the damage caused by the fight with Mirror Master last issue. Both Buddy and Ellen are pleased by this. Ellen, though, pushes her husband to reveal his powers are malfunctioning as she doesn't want him misrepresenting his abilities to his new team. Buddy is a little embarrassed, but he does come clean. He asks Martian Manhunter if they can go outside and talk. Elsewhere, we jump over to James Highwater, the man with amnesia we briefly saw in the epilogue last issue. James found himself in the desert last issue, and he didn't remember how he got there, and now he finds himself in his apartment. At least he assumes this is his apartment. His keys did work and let him inside, although it is like he is seeing his apartment for the first time, yet he recognizes everything. In his apartment, he finds a mysterious message that reads, Ask the Psycho Pirate. So, who is this Psycho Pirate? Well, he is going to be important to this story, so I'm going to give you some history on him. Psycho Pirate is a supervillain. His real name is Roger Hayden. He wears something called a Medusa Mask. And with this golden Medusa Mask, he is able to project emotions onto other people. Happy, sad, etc. In the Crisis on Infinite Earths storyline, the one where DC's entire universe got remade and characters got changed or retconned out of existence, well, at the end of that storyline, all the DC characters had no knowledge of how the world was like before the crisis. Superman and Batman and the Joker don't remember how the world used to be. However, at the end of Crisis on Infinite Earths, one person remembered. One person remembered how the world was. And that person was Psycho Pirate. On the last page of Crisis on Infinite Earths, Psycho Pirate was thought insane, and he was locked away in Arkham Asylum. Perhaps he was thought insane because he was the only one that knew the truth about how the world used to be. Well, he will be tying into the story of Animal Man in future issues. Back over to Buddy Baker and Martian Manhunter. Buddy explains the problem with his powers. He says, See, I can still fly okay, but 
After the gene bomb went off, everything else kind of got scrambled. I've been feeling really weak too, you know? And if I try to absorb maybe a cat's powers or something, I get chicken powers or something else instead. Martian Manhunter says that he wants Animal Man on the Justice League because he really respects the strong positions Animal Man has been taking on environmental issues and his advocacy for animals and the Earth. He really wants Animal Man to get better and be part of the team, and he's willing to do whatever he can to help him. Martian Manhunter suggests that Buddy go see a doctor that has been helping other heroes whose powers have also been affected by this gene bomb. Buddy, he promises that he will go see this doctor. He just has to deal with a fox hunting issue in Britain first, but as soon as he's done that, he'll go see this doctor. They then start flying to return to Buddy Baker's home. As they're flying, Buddy asks Martian Manhunter, You know, there's something that I've been meaning to ask you. How did Blue Beetle ever get into the Justice League? Martian Manhunter is stumped. He replies, Hmm, good question. While all of these events are going on, at the Baker home, the repairmen are fixing the house from the battle with Mirror Master. They are also installing some laser beams and other security weapons. Animal Man's identity is public, so it's important that they have some home security. Although, when a laser beam misfires in the house, Ellen begins getting a little nervous about all of these new gadgets and weapons that are being installed. As Cliff Baker returns from school to his home, the Justice League security weapons that were installed trap him in some lasers, and a gun pops from the floor, and it almost shoots Cliff. Cliff yells for his mom, Mom! In the kitchen later, Cliff is okay, and he is with his mom, as well as the others. Buddy and Martian Manhunter have returned, and the repairmen are there too. The repairmen slash security people explain that the weapons are all non-lethal anyway. Worst they would have done is put him to sleep for a couple minutes. Maxine, she laughs at her brother of how scared he was when he came home. Cliff is in a bad mood. He's angry. He's angry because he was being bullied at school. And they stole his bike, too. Martian Manhunter, hearing that Cliff had his bike stolen, wants to help him get his bike back. So later on, Martian Manhunter uses his shape-shifting abilities and impersonates Cliff. And he walks up to the bullies that stole Cliff's bike. As Cliff, Martian Manhunter asks for Cliff's bike back. The bullies refuse, and they call Cliff Animal Boy some more. And they also blow cigarette smoke in Cliff's face. Martian Manhunter as Cliff then transforms his body into a scary looking monster, and the bullies all run away. And the real Cliff then runs over and is so thrilled. He has his bike back, and he thanks Martian Manhunter for all of his help. Somewhere in Africa, a shaman is listening near the ground, and he warns that the gods are coming, thus setting up a storyline that will be visited in next volume. And with this, we end Animal Man Volume 1. Alright, so that was Animal Man Volume 1, and I thought this was very fun. The artwork was very 80s, maybe a little bit dated, but it worked for the story and wasn't too bad. I really liked the family dynamics in this series, seeing Buddy talk to his wife and kids and neighbors, all that is quite fun. I really like rooting for Animal Man, this kind of obscure, less popular character, he, him trying to make it in the world, trying to join the Justice League, so all that was great stuff. Now, the Bawana Beast story arc was our first story arc in this series. And it was a little bit weird, you know, Buana Beast is a weird, obscure character with an odd power set. But I actually kind of liked the story in the end. And Buana Beast's kind of animal merging powers kind of does make it an interesting uh, interaction for Animal Man to have to face this guy. And the whole tying it in with Star Labs was uh, interesting as well. So I thought it was a successful first story arc. Then we had the Coyote Gospel issue, which... Initially, I did not know it was going to be like a wily e. Coyote, Looney Tunes kind of situation. I was just reading this weird story about this Coyote Man, and I thought it was really weird, and I did not get it at first. But once I knew what they were trying to do, and I read it again, it actually is quite cool and a very interesting concept to explore of this writer, author, interacting with his work. So 
Uh, interesting stuff there. Then we had the Birds of Prey one, which was another weird one initially, but I grew to like it uh, as I read it a second time, of um, this Thangarian building this life bomb. And when the bomb went off and uh, that Thangarian's life was flashing through Animal Man's eyes, that was actually pretty cool. And it was kind of fun seeing Animal Man fight these two Thangarians, so that was a fun issue. We had the Death of the Red Mask issue, which was a little bit sad, although a little bit funny at times too of uh, hearing this villain's life story, and then he's kind of excited about being on TV, but then he just decides to jump anyway and see if he can fly. It's kind of an ending that really sticks with you. Then we had the Mirror Moves issue, where Mirror Master attacks Buddy in his home, and that was just quite fun. A supervillain fight in the home, Ellen kicks the guy in the nuts, so uh, it was a good time. Then we had the Martian Manhunter home improvements issue, which was also fun. Love Martian Manhunter just hanging out with Animal Man and them talking and going around. Yeah, we had some humor with the uh, Justice League repairman sort of building some contraptions in the house, some uh, safeguards and whatnot, so that was fun as well. And then in the end, Martian Manhunter helps out Buddy's son by uh, shape-shifting into the sun and confronting the sun's bullies, so that was a, a fun time. So yeah, this was a really fun opening arc that really went to a lot of places. So yeah, I'm going to give this one an 8.5 out of 10. I thought it was a pretty good time. Thank you all for watching, and I'll be back in the future with Volume 2.